Welcome back to another episode of the Brane Podcast, round two of our Shoot the Breeze series. That's when uh, Ryan and I get together and have a similar conversation as to what we'd have if we were sitting at the pub. Not a huge amount of news in aviation this week, so we thought it a good time to do it. As always, this episode today is sponsored by Brian and Ryan. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, yeah, Paul. How's it going, bud? Good year. Yeah, can't complain, man. Good week. <laughs> yeah, busy week. Busy week. Yeah, she's yeah, but uh, good nonetheless, man. Yeah, same. Yeah, not a huge amount of aviation news, no. so uh, good time to do a shoot the breeze episode. Our last one was, I'd say, quite successful, and uh, maybe reached a new set of audience. We've been speaking yeah. for a while about. Quite a few guys have more than one podcast, and maybe this uh, Shoot the Breeze at some point might turn into a podcast of its own. So give it a chance if you enjoy it. Let us know. Uh, probably not everyone's cup of tea because I know a lot of people do listen to us for that weekly aviation news. Like I said in the intro there, not a huge amount of news this week. It's the August holidays in Europe. America is still dealing with the same nonsense they were before. We've spoken at nauseam about the travel chaos and all that sort of stuff. Air, uh, Boeing and Airbus, Boeing back with the 787. Other than that, there's a bit of news about the freighter market. Freighter market, or cargo at least, sort of looks like it's reached a peak and has now sort of plateaued a bit. So we'll keep an eye on that going forward. But uh, today, yeah, shoot the breeze, have a chat, see what comes up, and let's take it from there. That's how we roll, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, quite right. Uh, there hasn't been a tremendous amount of news this last week, and uh, yeah, what better opportunity to uh, just you know touch base again, and uh, you know catch up, I suppose, and, and and talk the usual cockpit banter that we normally do. We don't get an awful lot of time to go and sit at the pub and uh, have a bit of a chat like we used to. <laughs> Like we did that a lot prior to uh, wives and kids. Yeah, we used to do, we used to do that quite often. But uh, yeah, no, there's there's very little time for that nowadays. Eh? Yeah, Jesus. we ripped the ring out of that one. <laughs> but yeah, shoot the breeze. All about uh, having a conversation about whatever comes up. I notice you, you you watch these podcasts, Joe Rogan in particular. I always wonder how do they plan beforehand the route they're going to go down in the conversation because it starts in like a pretty random place. It doesn't give an example. Like he had Chris Williamson on, or let's say like a Jordan Peterson. He doesn't start the podcast by saying, so tell us about your background. Where did you come from? Where did you get educated? It just starts in a random place and then sort of worms its way through a whole bunch of stories. Exactly. I don't think there is any I don't think so. scripted plan there, you know, just no. go with the flow. And that's what makes it cool, man. I uh -huh. mean, you know, I think you need that every now and again. You don't want to have the same old riff raff, yeah, yeah, it's the news again. It's it's actually like to just have a cool, plain sailing, smooth chat, as you would around the bra or in the pub or as we used to in the flight deck. <laughs> yeah, as we used to in the flight deck. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to, though, just bring listeners up to speed on a couple of stories that we had started through the year mm. and uh, you're pretty much sort of unended one so one of them has been our digitization here at Sumero of the documents that we use it was yeah. a project that ryan and i took on when ryan about four months ago or so yeah i'd say it's probably what uh march april thereabouts we yeah. got started with that and the plan was we know nothing about digital documents or at least having a system whereby we can uh, automate a lot of the processes and i'm quite happy and proud to say that we have found a system that requires a lot of work in the, the background by Ryan in particular, but we are very much up to speed and uh, doing really well with our digital documents. And it's it's been a project and a half, but I'm super, super proud of this project that's ongoing at the moment. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Paul. Uh, yeah, it's been quite a task to take on. Um, and yeah, we knew 
next Zip. to nothing about digitization in the beginning. It's it's been quite a lacquer learning curve. Yeah. And uh, yeah, now that it's pretty much up and running and just about everything is digitized, it's quite satisfying to see. You know, you almost get a bit of a an anxiety attack when you see a piece of paper floating around. Like you know, yeah, what's that doing here? That that's just untidy. Um, yeah, we've got it working well. It's uh, quite a slick program, and uh, yeah, very proud of it as well. Yeah, it's one of those things that requires a bit of upkeep on the side, and uh, we had a bit of, I suppose, background in it. We we used uh, digital documents to an extent at SACS. As the user. As the user, not, but now so much working with it on the back end. Yeah, trying to actually develop it and how do you get these documents to work and flow through to the next step and what needs to be filled in. And but it goes a bit deeper too because not only is, are the documents, not just a editable PDF, it's, it, there's certain processes that are automated. So if one instructor actually finishes a particular task, so let's say you're doing a, a sim session and you finish that sim session and another instructor takes over at a facility like ours. You in a, a much wide, you do a much wider range of instruction because you're not in your closed loop of your company. Mm. So you can't exactly pick up the phone, phone the next instructor, and say, you know, old Ryan and Brian are doing well, but uh, concentrate on this, this, and that tomorrow because you got more instructors, you got uh, a much uh, more clients, more students. So you need to keep a tighter lid on what's going on. And this program actually automates the paperwork for each session. So you click finish, the next instructor the next day can pick up any notes that we've written, you know, maybe if someone's battling with a steep turn or procedures or whatever it is, you can actually pass that information down in an automated fashion. It's kind of cool, kind of proud of it. And uh, actually owe big thanks to Ryan for, you know, working on the back end of that, as you can imagine, there was a lot of teething errors at the beginning by the end users and uh, Ryan sorted a lot of that out. So kind of cool. No, man, no thanks required. Eh? It's, uh, it's really, it's been a lot of fun actually working on that project. We got started off together. We, you know, we had to really, first of all, find what was the suitable program to mm. get working with. And that was a process in itself. Yeah. You know, we tried this one, that one, eventually settled on Fluix and like, okay, cool, Ukrainian this is great. Ukrainian company. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I must say, shout out to the team from... Uh, Fluix, the yeah. Ukrainian guys, especially the technicians. Dimitri and Sergey. Sergey. Yeah. Sergey. He's, Sergey. <laughs> He's very always good to help. <laughs> <laughs> no, the guys are great. They, 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 they're so um, on the ball and responsive to your requests. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun, man. I, I've actually enjoyed the challenge because you've learned a lot. Eh? It's been pretty stimulating. Mm. I mean, uh, yeah, the learning curve been great. Love it. It's been cool. So we're going to expand on it a bit more now. I suppose we've got other things that we need to get going that fall in line with the digital digitization. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes. Yeah, we'll keep you updated. But that was one of the things. And uh, the other thing, yeah, uh, Discord's going nicely. If you want to subscribe to that Discord, go check it out. It's there in the show notes. And uh, just a way for us to be in touch with our community. So the plan is today, Ryan, I thought we could chat about travel experiences. And we'll start with one of mine. And what, what I plan to do is we get so much information that comes in to us every week. And a lot of this stuff is, is often like it's, you know, it falls on the personal side. Ryan, this, uh, this is my opinion of the, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm doing. And uh, I notice it a lot, particularly when we go a bit deeper into a particular subject. If we start talking a bit more about Hong Kong this week, we'll tend to get a lot more responses from the guys in Hong Kong. And a lot of the time it falls on the sort of, Yo, you, 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 quite a personal level mm. and really nice because it, it helps us get close to the guys. So I would like at some point to be able to throw it out there as an example and say, like this week, travel experiences. Have you had any tour, contract work, charter, uh, gap year, something that falls inside the travel sector that had a big influence on your life? throw that out and then try and get responses from the guys and then maybe choose the best one and uh, talk about it on the show. You know, actually say this is what this happened to this guy and that guy. Yeah. And uh, I think that kind of falls in line with our thinking, the way we like to do things. So that's kind of the plan. And I uh, thought we'd get the ball rolling on that today. Sounds like a plan, man. So uh, 
What's your story? What's the story? <laughs> <laughs> What's been uh, the, the best experience of, or travel experience of your life so far? Yeah, well, you actually got the ball rolling on this when we were sitting around the braai. At Dalstra. Having beer number 23. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, you started asking about a particular period of my life. And uh, this is where this story came up. So you said, hey, that'll be cool to chat about on the podcast. So that's where the idea came up. And obviously you need to do it as part of these, uh, like a shoot the breeze episode because it doesn't exactly form part of the aviation news. Yeah. But it certainly was one that had a big impact on my life. And it's also not something that you're ever really going to get to talk about on someone else's podcast. You know, I had the privilege of being on one or two other people's podcasts where you get to talk about your experiences. And a lot of the time it ends up being about your, either your podcast journey or the aviation journey, which exactly. is what people are interested in hearing from us about. But the reality is that uh, I would not be half the person I am without some of those experiences that uh, I had along the way. Yeah. And I think that's part of this whole thing is about actually instead of narrowing it down to, to talk about this little minuscule part of your life, which in fact would be aviation, and widening it up to say, well, what else, what other shit have you gone and done? That's very cool. I, that I was like, my thinking. You well, know, I, I dig it as well because that's why – I remember, I remember that conversation we had in Dahlstrom, but it was a bloody good story. And uh, you know, the reason it got me thinking was we've spent so much time on the show talking about our 10 years at Saks and what we're doing now and everything. So I suppose a lot of our listeners know us for who we are in the last, yeah. let's say, 10 to 12 years. Yeah. But I mean, what were we doing before sex? Yeah. And uh, there was some adventure there. Yes, so uh, yeah. uh, your, your story is quite cool. And uh, I think it's it's time to... To let rip. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> I, I suppose that other guys and girls might uh, relate to it because a lot of people did it at the time, but I had a bit of a, a gap year after school. So I decided to uh, head across to the UK like so many South Africans did at the time. My old man, of course, was running executive aerospace at the time. And you know, Ryan, at that stage, you know, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I wasn't appreciative of what my dad was doing, but uh, I know how busy he was at the time. And now looking back then, I realize of all the cuck he must have had to deal with, you know, <laughs> yeah. rosters, planes, technicals, all the rest. And, uh, you know, he was incredibly busy with, uh, you know, running exec at that stage. And I just wasn't keen to go and fly just then. I wanted a bit of a, a, a gap, you know, get the mm. hell away. And, uh, yeah, so... Went off to the UK, two of my mates, shout out to uh, my one mate, uh, Brian, another Brian, and my mate, Dean Van Niekirk, who's in uh, PE, or whatever it's called now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we uh, we boarded that plane in Derbs, headed off to Joburg, and then caught, uh, I think it was a Spurry 747 at that stage to Heathrow. <laughs> and uh, thinking back now, and a lot of the time, you know, you know, what stories do you tell at a, at a bar with your mates? <laughs> a lot of the time it, these things come out there because it's such a vivid experience I had in my mind. Yeah. And it was such a cool time of my life. And uh, yeah, Ryan, so on that plane, I think similar to you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but had you been, when we traveled together to Berlin back in 2010, was that the first long haul flight you had done if i remember correctly that was the first time i'd ever been to europe okay um i had flown a lot around africa i mean obviously my career up until then had taken me all over the place yeah done a lot of flying around myself um but no it was the first time i'd actually ever boarded a an airliner as a passenger on a long-haul flight and flown to europe which is why as exciting as it was to go across to Germany to go and do a CRJ rating, it was coupled to, mm. damn, man, this is my, yeah. my first experience uh, of, of, of Europe and Germany. And I suppose that's why we, we weren't so stupid on the first day on drinking yeah. how many beers was there. Yeah. <laughs> it set so, things up for the future. Yeah, it was, it was a great experience. But yeah, that was, well, that was me. My mate Dean was in a similar situation. Mm. He hadn't been uh, overseas before as well. So first of all, you know, you get to experience this big wide body aircraft with with your mate and he quite can't believe that this thing's even getting airborne still quite clear in my mind 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, arrived in uh, Heathrow and my old man had a good contact there, someone we're still friends with today and someone that was quite a, a key part of Ryanair's startup and setup at the beginning. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, Glenville Smith. Shout out to Glenville. Okay. Glenville, one of these guys, uh, incredibly intelligent. He's a lawyer by trade, specialized in, on the aviation side. And Glenville had, had done really well for him in his life. He, he ended up in uh, in Windsor, of all places, about maybe 300 meters away from where the Queen lives. <laughs> Is it? So, of course, uh, Rosevia and uh, his chums move into Glenville's place there for a couple of days in the attic of his house, you know. Yeah? Yeah, right at the top of his place. Beautiful sort of area. And, uh, yeah, I'm there with my mate Dean and, you know, very confined space and everything because, you, you know, you, you used to uh, a slightly different uh, house type vibe. Yeah. And uh, I actually remember one night we th there was a, a tape cassette player there and uh, there was Braveheart. There was a Braveheart um, video cassette <laughs> that we were watching. And I said to Dean, yes, like we're really slumming it here at the moment. You know, it felt like we were like really – like slumming it a bit. Meanwhile, Windsor Castle's about you know, <laughs> 300 meters away, <laughs> thinking, uh, yeah, this is tough. But yeah, th basically what we did, we had uh, a, a bit of cash and traveler's checks, not a huge amount. And the plan was to go to the UK and uh, just go see what happens. No real plan. Uh, either make it work and stay there for you know a year and a bit, or if it doesn't work, come back home. Sometimes and those are the best laid plans. Right? Yeah, there was no plan. So we rocked up there and, you know, what the hell do we do? So as three uh, young South Africans walking around there, we try to figure out, you know, what's this all about? And, you know, one of the reasons the story came to mind and why it might be a good one for the podcast was I think a lot of those things learnt back then have had an impact now. And maybe I'm only seeing the effect of those things now today yeah. You know, at the time you know you, you go through these sort of life experiences and you take them on and they have an impact on the next decision and you take that next decision and it leads you somewhere else but you know you've heard all the basic things you know when you're when you're in the uk you've got to or overseas you've got to go get a job but to get a job you have to have a bank account to open a bank account you have to have a job so it's one of these like all around what the hell do you do yeah so the one way, the one trick around it is to uh, go apply at McDonald's <laughs> and then get uh, McDonald's to give you all the paperwork that you're going to go and be employed there, then shoot across to the closest HSBC or Barclays Bank, go open up your account, go back to McDonald's and say, listen, this job's not for me. <laughs> and, then, and then you've got your, uh, you've got your account open. Okay. Yeah. And Is that how you did it? That's how we did it. Yeah, <laughs> got the account open and, and that was that. So we cruising around Windsor there, which is, of course, one of the most affluent areas in Great Britain, <laughs> you know, trying to look for this job. And uh, we all, like, fell in love with Windsor because a lot of South Africans were in, at the time, and I'm sure still today, the Wimbledon sort of Fulham area, full of South Africans. I mean, really? you go there during a Springbok rugby game, full, full, full of South Africans. And... Uh, I was like, kind of, I said to my mate Dean, listen, if we're going to do this, then let's let's do it like, you know, Probably. when in Rome, you know, let's not go and find all the South Africans. Then we might as well stay in Derbs, you yeah, know. Yeah. So Windsor, there were no, so there was us, you know, we were known as the South African guys. <laughs> so there were no other South Africans. We were there having a jaw and uh, we enjoyed the place. So we said, well, let's try and find somewhere to work here. Mm. So what do you do? Go work in a bar. A lot of, lot, of, lot of South Africans working in bars and stuff like that. And uh, I think my mate Dean, he got a job as a pot washer at one point at some <laughs> restaurant. And, and then eventually uh, we saw this uh, bus driving past and the, the bus had a big Legoland uh, sort of banner on it, you know, advertising Legoland Windsor. Yeah. Because Legoland, huge children's theme park, basically. So for kids, it, it, it's mainly for kids. So from two up till, uh, yeah, probably fifteen or sixteen or so. But then they also have an area of the park called Miniland, which is basically the world made of Lego. So all different sections, which I suppose is more like aimed at the grandparents and parents' yeah. side. So 
it's not made for the young sort of you know late teenager early 20s it's sort of for younger kids and then the the parents Oaks like us yeah exactly <laughs> so um yeah we went and uh applied at uh legoland and um yeah i mean geez ryan before then i've probably missed out a few a few little steps but we you know i suppose a lot of these are, are like cliche things that happens to a lot of guys but Oh, we got kicked out of our first place because we, I can't remember what it was with a deposit. My mate Brian, the other Brian, he lost it one day with the landlord. The landlord then kicked us out the next day. We're there we're wondering what the hell to do. Ring, ring, phone, Glenville. Glenn, I'm staying at your house one more day type of vibe. But anyway, we met someone who said, guys, you can't cruise around London or Windsor your age like this without a bicycle. You need freaking bicycles. I was like, okay, cool, or whatever. Um, so sh this lady went to like the equivalent there of a macro yeah, and bought us three bikes, a green one, a blue one, and a red one. <laughs> and uh, the red one had the most gears, so I naturally took that one. <laughs> my mate uh, Dean took the, the green one, uh, if I remember correctly, and then my, my Brian, the other one. And, uh, and then we had wheels, so now we're cruising around. Uh. <laughs> so one night after way too many... Uh, drinks so if you want introduction to england what is england what is the uk how does it differ from south africa i think we got we got caught one night driving home or riding home <laughs> and under the influence with no lights on the bike it's a huge no-no in the uk no way yeah. have Seriously. to have lights and don't be pissed when you're riding a bike like whatever on the side of the road a bicycle it's like no you can't ride a bike hammered a bicycle and you got no lights. It's no the equivalent way. here of driving home with no license, no lights, and you hammered. In a car. Yeah. Kind of thing. So fortunately, <laughs> we, <laughs> we got away with that. And um, yeah, so going back to Legoland, we, we all got in. So we're all now working at Legoland, three South African oaks. And uh, I'm sorry to say for all the employers I've had since then. So, you know, the... You know, my first flying job, uh, Sax, yeah, Samira, all the rest. None of them compare or even come close to the experience of working at Legoland. There are 600 employees, I think, that work in the park daily. Those are all, you know, uh, young guys and girls between 18 and probably 24. Yeah. All there to have a job. <laughs> so you can imagine the, the, what goes on. What an experience it was. Legoland, of course, uh, or Lego, uh, Scandinavian company. So a lot of Scandinavian people work there, which they, you know, Scandinavian hooligans are very, very cool to hang out with. Of course. And uh, Ryan, it was just one of those uh, unbelievable experiences that, uh, that will live with me forever. Uh, it was my first experience of proper work. Yeah. And it was like... It almost set you up badly because, like, well, what, what's all the fuss about? You know? <laughs> yeah. When, when, yeah. You, when you joined Sax, it's like, this isn't exactly Legoland. <laughs> this isn't the same vibe. <laughs> but it was just awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, just one of those things. Won't go into all of it now, but a really fantastic experience. And we used to earn what we could yeah. and then take that bucks and go and travel. Listen, you showed me a photo album and, and one of your pay slips from Legoland. <laughs> yeah. And what year was that? That was 2001. That wasn't bad money. It wasn't. In pounds? No. Or 2004. How it, old were you? It was about 340 pounds. 345 pounds. For, for a, was it a two-week yacht? Every, you got paid every two weeks. So 340 pounds. So caught it nearly 700 pounds a month. Put it I mean, this way, Ryan. There was a lot of money left. For for drinking yes. and uh, eating hot dogs. For for how old were you then? Yeah, eighteen. My man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was legit. I mean, we we thought we had you know our, our butts were in the butter for of sure. Course. And and Rosevia being Rosevia, I was working with the you know with the kids, yeah. the the youngsters on the you know these Lego cars that drive around and all the rest. But there was another section, like I said, this mini land section. Mm. And there was a girl that worked there. Her name was Paula. Paula was from Nelsprite. Now, yeah. naturally, uh, I got to know, know Paula. Her nickname was Nelsprite. So, <laughs> now Paula, I said, hey, come on, you, you've got to get me in this department, you know, because there was a slightly higher earning. I think it was five, I think five pounds 50, I think it was an hour 
that yeah. you got there, if I remember. It was slightly more. It was like a pound an hour more than what the other oaks were getting. Yeah. So I wormed my way into this mini land apartment. And what it also meant was when it was pouring with rain, you were in your little... You were uh, cozy. You were cozy <laughs> in your... Uh, it was like a, there was like a garage you worked in and you know you had to fix things yeah. and uh, things like that. But the other oaks were there on the, the, the rides. My <laughs> mate Dean in particular, yes, he used to make me laugh. His job, he got there. He used to ride the... He was the train driver that... This kid's train that went all the way around uh, the park. Shit. Yeah, he would be Riley's best mate. Right yeah. now. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen that train that goes around the like the malls and the stuff. Hamleys yeah, train yeah, yeah, that yeah. goes around yeah. the, the malls, like Santon, they do it. Yeah. And but this is a much bigger train. It's a mm. proper train that goes around the entire park. And you're not supposed to like, you know, toot the horn or anything on there. But every time <laughs> Dean went past me in the section, he would he would uh, blow that horn and I would, hey, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, yeah, when it was pouring with rain, old Dean was out there on the train getting soaked. And I was sitting in a warm uh, uh, sort of uh, garage fixing uh, broken Lego. It was kind of cool. That was my job. That's a typical rose of <laughs> Typical. <laughs> typical, typical. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, was, it, was, it was a very cool yeah. position. And uh, yeah, yeah I, owe, I owe Paula, wherever she is in the world right now. But um, okay. yeah, so that was that. Was that. And, and yeah, we used to earn bucks, uh, save it all, and then go and travel. And we went to some cool places, Ryan. We did For some sure. cool things. I mean, I went, I saw the, the Monaco Grand Prix with my old man. Was that during that? Uh, yeah, that was during yeah. that. So my old man, I, I met him there. But funny, there's a funny story attached to that because yeah. when I went to the French embassy to apply for my visa, because we we're going to Nice first and then across to Monaco, mm. the, the, the consulate there said, no, this passport is invalid. It's expired. So I was like, what are you talking about? I mean, I've been to Australia on that passport. I've been to, I got my ancestral visa from the uk on that passport yeah how can it expire yeah so on the front page i, mean, I showed you that passport yesterday mm. it's got it's got it's got like old school dark blue yeah passport and then it's got where the expiry date is it says c page 14 or something and if you go across to page 14 it says this passport's expiry date is and it was like 1998 11 30 because that's when i would have turned 16 so for some reason, South Africa at the time, maybe they, maybe you couldn't sign prior to 16 for your passport. So it was only valid to 1998. Meanwhile, I got my ancestral visa on there, everything on that passport. No one picked it up <laughs> except now at the French embassy. So what happened? How did you get it So now that? I'm stuck in, in England with basically an expired passport <laughs> and no, a null and void ancestral visa. And... Uh, and I'm supposed to go to Monaco. This is like a Monday. I'm supposed to be supposed to arrive in Monaco for practice on Friday for the Grand Prix. And my old man's miffed because, you know, he wants to go to this Grand Prix and I'm meeting yeah. him there. Mm. And uh, the only thing we could do, and as luck would have it, my dad spent quite a bit of time flying uh, Butelezi around. Oh, yeah? Yeah, back in the day in the... Not sure what his position was in the IFP back then or whatever, but uh, Butelezi, and I might be, I might have to check this. I should have checked this before the show. <laughs> but he was the, no, he was the, in charge of the consulate in London at the time. So South African Embassy, uh, Butelezi was the. He was the big boss there. He was the big boss there. No ways, I didn't know that. And my old man, and anyone that knows my dad won't be surprised with this. He managed to get hold of Butelezi. <laughs> and uh, and my dad had met him a few times, but obviously, like I mean, it was very early on in my dad's career, and and Butelezi didn't remember who my dad was yeah. until my dad said, "I'm the pilot with the gap in his front teeth." <laughs> <laughs> really? And then Butelezi said, ah, "I know exactly who you are." Yeah. And then he said, uh, "My son's got this issue," and he said, "You must meet me here uh, before we open the." consulate tomorrow morning at uh, eight o'clock or whatever i was in windsor at the time caught the train early in the morning met him there went up to the top dog's office at the top took the old passport away put a new stamp on a new passport there's your passport go and enjoy the grand prix so did you meet butelezi yeah you joke yeah no way sorted out the passport hey yeah Legit. holy shit 
Yeah. That's something else. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, what a story. Yeah. And that was, yeah, back 2000. But th that's how I got to Monaco in the end. But that was all sort of yeah. entwined in this sort of gap year away. And of course, went to the Grand Prix. Uh, Schumacher driving for Ferrari at the time, won that Grand Prix. Uh, we were actually sitting next to, in, at that Grand Prix, we were sitting next to a family, a, a, a doctor, his wife, and then two daughters. Mm. And that doctor was the dude, uh, a few years later, he, I saw this guy, that was the guy from the Grand Prix. He was on Carp Blanche. He was the doctor that was a big moral dilemma around the world because he was busy cloning a, a, a sheep. No yeah, it was him. way. It's the got same his guy. Got his business card there at home. Yeah, legit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bullshitting. I promise you. You can ask my old man. Shit, eh? And uh, yeah, so yeah, some cool stories from there as well. Yes. Monaco as a Grand Prix is just on another planet. No, I listen, mean, don't even get me started. I was like, I was going to try not to comment. Like, listen, screw you for making mm. it to Monaco. <laughs> That's yeah. like high up on my bucket list. No, uh, it's just one of those. But it must have been epic. Eh? One of those things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you stay in, we stayed in Nice because obviously Monaco is on a, yeah, it's ridiculously expensive. There. And during that weekend, it's just about the Formula One mm. race. Stayed in Nice, had an awesome time with my dad there. And uh, yeah, memory is still very clear. We went to the practice on the Friday, then the, the, the qualifying, no, sorry, there's no practice. On, the practice is on Thursday, I believe, in, in Monaco. No practice on the Friday, then qualifying on a Saturday. And then on the train ride from Monaco back to Nice, it's about a 15-minute train ride. Obviously, this train is packed. Mm. And there's some guys at the back of the train. You can hear that these guys are proper Dutchies, you know, <laughs> but they were, they were from Zim. And uh, so we get to talk to these guys. <laughs> Wearing Jeep shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we start talking to these guys and uh, they were talking about the, the race. And the, the one uh, Zimbabwean guy says, no, he, uh, well, not Zimbabwean, Rhodesian. They're always Rhodesian when yeah. you meet them. Oh, away. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's saying, no, he was invited to this uh, penthouse, you know, flat to go and watch the race, you know. But the Oak wanted, like, uh, I can't remember what it was at the time. It probably equivalent now to about two or three grand in, in rands you know it wasn't cheap at the time yeah so my dad hearing this said oh can we have the oaks number you know so we took the number and got hold of the guy and we ended up watching the formula one race um on the sandavot corner in a flat that was owned by i believe nick hardfelt one of the formula one drivers dads and uh uh, unbelievable run from a flat <laughs> on the corner ferrari came uh, barrichello came second schumacher won the race barrichello second and uh it was like it was epic uh, how mean, do you top that hey? no it was it was Jeez. it was top of the pop so really it was it <laughs> was so cool and uh yeah back to of course that was one of the little trips the other one that came out of that trip was a Oh, must have been about a week we went away. My, myself and Dean, we said, right, we want to do a nice trip, you know, at that uh, part of this UK experience. What are we going to do? And uh, one of the things that was that that was happening, and it happens in September, not October, is the uh, German Beer Festival. <laughs> yeah. The Oktoberfest happens in September there in Munich. Yeah. So my mate Dean really wanted to go to that, and I really wanted to go to that. So we make a plan. Let's go. But we had spent quite a bit of cash already as it is. There wasn't a huge amount uh, <laughs> available there. So um, we go back and we say, well, you know, we've got to buy tickets and all the rest. So Glenville at the time, he says, no, don't try and buy a ticket to Munich. Go look somewhere else close by, you know, a town that's sort of that Ryanair fly to, but not a, you know, because that was Ryanair's the way they got going. You know, yeah. they, they didn't fly, fly to these to the big hubs. places, yeah. So we checked their Salzburg. So Ryanair, and I've got a picture of this, Ryanair, we bought those tickets from, we left from Stansted and flew to Salzburg. And Dean's ticket and my ticket combined cost us 80 pence. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, right. We paid for the airport taxes, that was it. We bought them two days before the flight. Ryanair obviously couldn't sell those tickets, so they just go off on this sort of special. Yeah. Bang, 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 bought those tickets. 
Um, caught the bus across to Stansted early one morning, shot across, landed in Salzburg, went to a youth hostel there. Uh, I can't remember the rest, hammered. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, caught, the, caught a train from Salzburg through to Munich. And of course, on this train is now wild, eh? Because people, you know, people aren't going there to drink tea and biscuits. Yeah, you know? Everyone's on the way to the yeah. beer fest. So, two South Africans, typical, typical story. I'm sure this has happened lots. Arrive in Munich. So, cool, Dean. What are we gonna do? Dean says, oh, I reckon, yeah, let's go find ourselves some accommodation. Cool. That hotel looks, this looks alright. Let's go there. We walk across there. Hello, ma'am. Uh, any accommodation for us? She says. <laughs> During Oktoberfest. <laughs> 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 You're like, yeah, no, nah, forget about it. Ain't going to happen. So, like, what do you mean? No, this is, the town is, there is no space. Like, it doesn't matter where you go, the, you will not find accommodation in uh, Munich over that period. Oh, so we say, well, fuck it. Let's go to the <laughs> Hofbrau house because that's what you know, know about. Yeah. This was about two o'clock in the afternoon. You would appreciate the story. End up at the off brows, 12 o'clock at night, eight of those super freaking <laughs> things later. Uh, what are we going to do now? Yeah. And uh, that was it. Game over. Uh, far too much to drink. No accommodation. Got our backpack. Got yeah. our passports, but no accommodation. Eh? <laughs> Shit, but it's cold, eh? It's like, it's not, it's not warm. Yeah, it's, it's like, going into like the, the autumn season. Yeah. yeah and, I, and, and I'd had... I had too much to drink. There was no question. It was, I was done. I could not have any more. So there was this uh, a very good looking phone booth <laughs> that was not far from this, uh, this off brow house. I said to my mate, Dean, listen, I can't go too far. Let, let's freaking go into this phone booth. We'll close that freaking door. We'll just doors here. <laughs> but those German phone booths have got like, uh, well, they did. I'm sure there's no phone booths there anymore. But uh, they were sort of hollowed out at the bottom. So they had this, yeah. glass thing on the outside but there was nothing at the bottom so the air used to rush through there and it was flipping freezing um so we said yes that was a that was a tough night we're not going to do that again so wake up go grab ourselves some uh, croissant or something and end up sort of back at the off bra house but you know i got to talk to a few people there and they said no you know um if you if you stuck with accommodation, you know, just go to the bloody train station. You know, I mean, the train <laughs> station's at least warm. Oh, yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea. So, Dean and I go off, and I'm not sure if this was on the second or the third night. Might have even been, been later, but we end up in yeah you know, sleeping in this train station with about maybe another ten Australian guys. But they were also there having a, a jaw with her. So. Being South African now, we're very conscious of like the our passports. You know, you can't lose this passport. I've just had to fight to get this passport back. So yeah, I'm exactly. not like Imagine we've got phoning our, Butelezi again. Yeah. Saying, Listen, I, <laughs> yeah, we've got our we've got our czar that is not worth a huge amount there. <laughs> but you know, at the time, you're like really holding on to it. So we, yeah. you know, very conscious of the whole theft thing that goes on. So Dean and I, you know, kipping in the train station that night, holding on to these backpacks with our passports and stuff and. And of course, so, so we now we've been jawling with these Aussie guys the whole day. We were at the Hofbra house with them. Went on some of the roller coasters. They were they were they were around, and and so now they're in this sort of train station. And um, they wake up in the morning. The one I can meet myself and Dean are in no condition to be uh, operating any heavy equipment. You know? <laughs> but this Australian oak is even worse because he comes to us. He says, like, "Hey guys." Um, like all my shit's stolen. Someone's have you seen my backpack? Someone's taken my stuff. And uh, my mate Dean, he was always quite, uh, you know, he was careful with his money. He wouldn't go and spend. He wasn't. He wasn't like uh, me and you. Yeah, you know? <laughs> he wouldn't. He wouldn't spend unnecessarily. So the easiest way out of this for Dean was to say, "Listen, sorry, bro, but we don't speak English." <laughs> 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 and uh, that was that the Australians didn't want to talk to us again <laughs> but j just a super cool experience Ryan yeah and uh, loved every minute the people I met there at the time we're still in contact today we still mates with them today uh, loved England loved Windsor if it wasn't for my dad saying listen but you need to now come home and you've got to go and 
start doing the adult thing, yeah, do I something promise you I'd still be there, probably <laughs> running a podcast or something. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't have had the aviation uh, side behind me. So I'm glad it happened when it did. Yeah. It definitely had a big impact on my life. It it definitely forms a major part of the stories that I will no doubt, doubt be telling my daughter about so one day. And yeah. I'm so, so happy I did it. And it just got me thinking, you know, we do this podcast where, you know, our, our sort of slogan is aviation and then travel. Travel is such an important part of it. You know, without, they go hand in hand. I kind of look at the aviation thing as the flying, the airplanes, the manufacturers, the crew. But the travel is the sitting at the airport, the excitement, the the cities, the all the rest. And it, it forms such a big part of what we do. And I would... If someone had to say to me, well, you know, what do I miss the most about not operating an aircraft at the moment? It's that walking through international for me. Yeah. I used to love that because everyone is, is excited. Everyone is No, there's that buzz, man. It's it's like it's like being at a concert because everybody's going somewhere. There's mm. you know it's just it's electric. It's a it's an amazing amazing atmosphere and uh yeah, i have to agree I, I miss that the most as well yeah um yeah because there's such an excitement about travel and it's cool that you know that is back now mm. um but it would be cool to be doing more of that as well yeah it, it's such a important aspect and the podcast i think will always have a quite a serious travel element attached to it because of my enjoyment of actually, you know, my wife always says her bags are always packed. You know, don't have to ask her twice to go and travel. She loves to travel. Oh, yeah. And I suppose the only thing that holds us back from traveling and holds so many people back is the cost element involved. I mean, if it was cheaper, we'd do it a lot more often. Uh, and, of course. Uh, but it's an amazing thing to do. And I thought that's why today let's throw that out there, some travel experiences and also to try and highlight the the importance of it, the importance of getting away. The podcast at the beginning, you know, 2020 early on was all about, you know, being positive around how many times did we mention, you know, be positive, be proactive, you know, do the right thing. And, and it, it resonated with a lot of people. Yeah. It's actually where we got our, our start because people, you know, yeah. at least these guys are being positive. And I suppose it's progressed along the way where we, we try and keep that element going. And, you know, maybe people will resonate with uh, with other things as well. And, you know, you know, particularly when it comes to, oh, I'm not saying advice is the right word. We're not saying go and travel, it'll save your life. But there are certain experiences that you need to, you need to take the plunge and go and experience for them to um, have meaning later on. And certainly traveling and traveling those experiences is such an important part. It's vitally important. And in fact, I mean, we took that short little weekend break with our families two weeks ago, and that's where this conversation obviously started. But it was because we took that break. We went and sat there in the bush looking at the mountains, lit a fire, had a few drinks, and we started having a different kind of conversation with each other. And uh, I mean, this was the first time, I mean, I've known you for... 12 odd years yeah plus more and uh i'd never heard that section of your story because it always been about other things yeah and, uh, and it made me realize shit man you know if you don't travel you don't do things you're never going to get the stories yeah and uh have those experiences it's vitally important i suppose having kids and i'm sure you feel this as well yeah there's a lot of there's quite a lot of good advice that also comes out of things like instagram and that these days there's a lot of rubbish on there yeah but like I follow this like daily dads thing on Instagram. It's like a stoic thing, but like yeah. for dads. And I think uh, it's uh, yeah, it's followed by a lot of people. It's uh, Ryan Holiday's oh, one yes. of his thing. Who's, you know, stoic wisdom and all that. Yeah. And a lot of that is about letting your kids do things that are they're not going to get hurt, but they they're not one hundred percent safe. So. You have to kind of find a, a gap between, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna let my child sort of try and walk across that sort of rocky uh, patch of, you know, yeah. and fall and hurt her knee or whatever, without trying to stop her because it's quite an in, integral part of growth and growing yeah. up. And yeah. certainly, I think that's probably what my dad's mindset was back in. Uh, 
because I think now GC was kind of brave to let me loose there in the <laughs> UK on my ace, or, you know, with my mates. But, you know, there, there's a lot of dangers involved. But kind of if you do things for the right reason and you, you, you come out of it the other side, you definitely come out a stronger, wiser, and more complete person. So I'm forever grateful that I got to do something like that. But there's so many things that we can actually do. Yeah. We make fun of Joburg. There isn't a huge amount to do in Joburg. But uh, there actually is if you go out there and, and, yeah, and use look, your imagination. And use your imagination. You can actually make it kind of cool. Of course. So that's my story, bro. That's power story, man. I enjoyed it. And, uh, and I'm glad we got the chance to actually talk about it on the podcast yeah. because – it is a cool story. I had a good chuckle. <laughs> I about haven't it. spoken about that for a hell of a long time. So yeah. it's actually I had to try and remember all the things. And we could go a hell of a lot deeper into it, but I wouldn't want to. No, of course. Yeah. I mean, like I say, while we were having that chat around the fire in Delstrom and you were talking about it, it was like, yes. Uh, listening to it for the first time, I was like, man, you, you had a pretty good adventure. It was a cool. great adventure. And uh, yeah, I wish I'd done something similar. I, I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. I, I left school and went straight into flying because that's what I wanted to do. Now you started flying early on, eh, right? I did, yeah. I basically, I actually left school a year early because the school I was in, was like a small little private school, they um, they decided that they weren't going to carry our class through to matric anymore. So they said, listen, you guys need to bugger off. Find your own way through. And uh, I, I'd sussed out at that stage that if I went to a technical college, I could do standard nine and ten in one year okay. and finish school a year earlier than all my other mates. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was smart. So Ryan skipped a year. I skipped a year, got through early, started flying, working very early. And uh, yeah, sometimes I wish, you know, maybe I should have had a gap year as well just to go and figure things out. But anyway, it turned out okay. I had uh, a lot of good adventures. And uh, it's funny, you mentioned Nail Um <laughs> That was where I landed my first flying job mm -hmm. as well. Um, he had a good time down there. Um, lots of great stories, adventures. Came out of that. Met my wife in Nelspruit. Right? Mm -hmm. So this sounds like another shoot the breeze episode. Yeah, coming out I now. think this one uh, <laughs> <laughs> we might might just say this for all different episodes. Ryan's aviation or Ryan's uh, career post school sounds yeah. like a cool one. Yeah. So we'll keep it for another story because yeah, there's there's quite a bit to mention. Yeah, there, we must talk about that because. <laughs> It's actually you get you get quite a kick out of talking about things, and that's why I'm so grateful for this podcast. Yeah, look, it's it's, it's really nice to actually be able to talk about what we did before sex. You know, it's it's kind of liberating in a yeah. way. You know, uh, sex. Okay, we all know, big part of our probably a third of our lives. Yeah, realistically, and uh, okay, it's been and done. We've spoken about that dead horse, and uh, you know, to talk about the adventures before that's really really cool. Yeah, <laughs> the. Talking about things, even if uh, a bit of advice I give to guys here in training, you know, when they're trying to learn the procedures and the calls, you ask them to try and verbalize those calls when you're driving in your car. So mm. if you're doing, uh, you're, you know, trying to learn the SOPs on, a, on an aircraft, then try and verbalize them and what's the response going to be. And obviously it's much better if you can do that with someone. But verbalizing it is a totally different thing to formulating those ideas in your mind mm. and one of the things that i realized on this podcast how deep do you have to go into a story so how much knowledge do you need you, you read a bit of information a headline let's say it's, it's about uh someone trying to buy mango mm. okay you can't just read that headline and one story and then come and speak about it confidently on the podcast it's impossible yeah. you actually have to have a little bit more background information yes and when you try to start speaking about it on the, on the podcast and it's happened to me numerous times and i'm sure the listeners have actually noticed i actually don't know enough about that subject to be talking about it <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it like gives you a kick up the ass because you say next time you better be prepared. And if you're going to formulate an opinion, <laughs> you better be formulating the right opinion because it's quite difficult to go back on what you said previously. True story, yeah. And, and that to me is where the value of the podcast is. And that's why we have invested in the podcast. My belief is that there will be, I think we're all going to have a podcast type thing in the future where you're going to have the ability to broadcast your, your, your words because audio is... Uh, is is vital audio is i mean blogs and that are dead i mean no one no one wants to yeah. to blog it, it it's about an audio and, and it's more accessible 
than video and uh, you know audio i suppose more people in the world can see video they understand it and you know jordan peterson said you know don't confuse yourself with the wave with the whole um a surfer doesn't confuse himself with the wave yeah talking about the the rise of youtube and you know the ability for people to see your work but certainly with an audio it's accessible to so many people in so many different er i mean in the car at home at gym whatever yeah so i i think that the value of audio and the value of the podcast for me is not necessarily the podcast as a entity it's the value that it provides you and me in terms of personal growth where you're able to sit here and talk about subjects that we find very interesting that are a big part of our lives and you actually try and get to formulate the ideas and articulate them well enough in your mind and by voice that people actually can understand and resonate with them. So I'm forever thankful for this podcast and forever thankful and grateful for the people that listen to it. So thank you. Same here, guys. You know, thanks for all the support and everything. And, uh, you know, thanks for the encouragement all the, mm. along the way as well. The encouragement a goes a long way because this has been a, a learning curve and a, geez, a journey of note as well. You know, talk about a journey of self-discovery. And I read a very interesting thing the other day where it says you, you've got to go and do things that, well, do hard things. That are difficult. You have to. You have, you have to. to. And this has been exceptionally difficult yeah. for me because I've never been yeah. the best public speaker. I've yeah. hated it. Mm. And, uh, yeah, you know, turns out that this is the one thing that I thoroughly enjoy every week. Mm. And, uh, yeah, you know. I hear you. Long may it continue. I hear you. <laughs> one last bit of advice for today. Yeah. Mentioned before, but it's worthwhile. You have to be willing to suck at something. Yeah. And when I first... When, when I first came across that and tried to understand it, I thought it was more about, like us starting the podcast, you have to agree with yourself that you're going to be useless at it at first, but you you will you know you'll get better with time. Or at least try. Yeah, yeah. you'll try. Simon Sinek's got this, uh, you know, his idea is if you go to gym every day for 15 minutes, you won't, or 20 minutes, you won't see the result after a day or a week or even a month. But if you do that every day for an extended period of time, you absolutely will start seeing the results. Yes. So you will suck at the beginning, but it goes a bit further than that. If you're going to invest your time and effort, like we do, Ryan, into this podcast, I mean, we've got jobs, we work. So this is our sort of free time that we use. We dedicate it to the podcast. But this is also time that you are not at gym you're not socializing with your other mates. You're not, uh, you know, even with your wife and kids. Yeah. You, you hear. So you, your fitness is taking a knock. Your time with your other mates socializing is taking a knock. And that's okay because you're investing it in an area where you think this is the right thing for me. So that is my thing for this week. You have to agree with yourself that you're going to suck at something. And it doesn't mean you'll never get that back. It just means for now, this is a thing where your time and your effort is uh, focused. And that means if it's focused here, it ain't going to be focused somewhere else. So it's okay to have that. That's my thing for this week. I hope you all enjoyed the show. Brilliant advisory. Thanks, pal. Great conversation. Yep. Loved it today. Cheers, everyone. Can't wait for the next one. Bye for now. Ciao. Remain at frequency 28 right echo echo third for takeoff. Right, I can slip and take up and we're heading where we'll be limited 36 seconds. Yeah, 204, 28 right echo, echo line up and wait. Not a 204. 40, 103, contact Chicago departure. Departure, good morning. Good morning. That was 552, I'm still up there. 250 on another train. Let's hit a 3494 for now, stand November short of Echo Echo, and we'll work that out. You can expect the full length for departure. November short of Echo Echo, we're 3494. Scott with 553, uniform turn left heading 220 and contact Chicago departure. Left heading 220, contact departure, Scott 553 uniform. Guide 204, fighting 2708, right Echo Echo, clear for takeoff. 828, right at Echo Echo, clear for takeoff, heading 270, United 204. Scott 5169.